Welcome everybody to Introduction to Deep Learning. Um, today we're going to talk about neural network architectures. And with that, I would like to follow up pretty much what we had been doing in the previous lecture. And we have been discussing how convolutions work. So we introduced CNNs. And the idea of a CNN is you have a filter. In this case, we have a 5x5 filter. Um, and this filter here, this is this little thing here, right? For every location on the image where you can slide it over, you're going to produce one output value. And then we're going to get our activation map for this filter. Um, and the idea of the convolutional network is that we are learning the filter weights. The thing what I mentioned was pretty important are the indices here. So if you're looking here at the image where we applying the convolution to, um, the resolution here is 32 times 32 times 3. So we have RGB or like three channels in depth here. Um, and that means we also need the convolutions to have three in terms of depth because that's by default always how we're going to apply the convolutions. And then we have a five by five filter. We have no padding here, meaning that we go here from 32 times 32 to 28 times 28 times one. Now, in a convolution layer, we have, of course, not only a single convolution, we have multiple. So now we have a second filter. That means we're going to get a second activation map. And each of these filters is going to have its distinct, distinct set of weights. Um, and in the conf layer, we have multiple of these filters and multiple of these activations. And we're going to get our set of activation maps here. And these are the five filters that we have. And each of them, as I said, have their separate weights. These weights are all learnable. They are the filter weights and a bias, respectively, for each kernel. Yeah, and that this is our, our convolutional um, layer. And then we did a lot of stuff on dimensionality. Um, dimensionality was pretty important to understand what's going on. It's basically in a conf layer, we want to apply the filters at every possible location possible. So we have here the input, which is n by n. We have a filter size, with filter size which is f by f. And then we have a stride, which means how many locations are we going to skip where we apply the filter. And then the output dimension is n minus f divided by s plus 1. Um, and that's our dimensionality where we're applying the filters. Uh, important thing, be aware that fractions are illegal. If you do this in PyTorch, you're probably going to get an error on any other deep learning framework. Um, so that's something you should always do when you're designing your architectures. Um, we also discussed a little bit about padding. Um, for instance, if we did not want to reduce the dimensionality, you have to set the padding to P equals F minus one half. Um, and that just means, okay, we're just going to expand. And typically when we're talking about padding, we mostly mean zero padding on the boundaries. Okay. So, um, and now the idea is we have a convolution. We have a convolution layer. Um, and then we're going to build an architecture around that. So we have these, these diff different filters across layers. So we have here low level, mid level, high level um, features. Uh, and then at the end, we have some sort of like loss, which is maybe, I don't know, like a, a binary cross entropy, or in this case, if it's a classifier, probably a softmax. Um, and we would like to figure out how um, to train the whole thing. So we have nonlinearities in between, we have to figure out how to do gradient backpropagation, and then we can learn our networks, and we're going to get typically filters like these ones. And this leads us to the CNN prototype. The CNN prototype is kind of like this successive iteration of conf, relo, conf, relo, and sometimes a little bit of pooling uh, in between. Um, and then at the end of the day, you typically have a fully connected layer, which gives us, um, which maps it down to the, which maps the scores essentially to your classes. So if you have like doing this in ImageNet, you're going to have um, probably a thousand classes. If you're doing it on Cypher 10, you're going to have 10 classes and so on respectively. Okay. So, this is something we want to talk about today in a little bit more detail. Um, and it turns out it really matters how you stack these convolutional filters together. Um, and in principle, if we are summarizing what we have right now is we actually have all the building blocks needed to build pretty powerful neural networks, um, but we don't know exactly how to put them together. And that's what we're going to do today. And this lecture is actually also a little bit of a history um, how people have been doing architecture design over the over the recent years. And what's kind of interesting, 
like in the literature, of course, there's like certain architectures that have survived. These are the architectures that a lot of people use. Um, and there's multiple reasons why we're going to talk about these specific architectures. So one of them, obviously, they were pretty important milestones. They are kind of like prototype architectures where you can, you know, then derive your own network from it. Um, but in modern days, the architectures, they also have a different meaning, meaning they're often pre-trained and pre-training is pretty expensive. So a lot of times when you dealing with your own neural network problem, you're going to rely to an existing architecture that already exists. Okay, so let's start with one of the first convolutional architectures that existed, if it's not the first one that gained actual popularity, uh, which was this famous Linnet architecture. Um, so this architecture is named after Jan Le Kun. Um, the, the Le stands for Le Kun. Um, and Jan Le Kun was, um, was a famous researcher, or is a famous researcher. He's currently at Meta. Um, he's been doing convolutions all his life, pretty much. Um, and he was working on these problems in the 90s specifically, how to do uh, number recognition specifically for bank checks. And the idea there is you have like a handwritten digit like this one, and you want to take this handwritten digit in the convolutional network, and then you want to figure out a 10-way classification that tells us which of the digits it is. So from zero to nine, basically. Um, and you can see this is an architecture was done in 98, right? So it's, well, not ancient, but well, comparatively speaking to modern architectures, probably ancient, um, but it's not, it's not that long ago when people have been doing these kind of architectures. And yeah, so let's have a look. Okay, so we said we do digit recognition. We have these handwritten digits. We have 10 classes. Um, input is, in this case, 32 times 32. It's a grayscale input, so we only have one channel here. Um, and we have the respective labels given. In this case, we have the class 7, which is the ground truth for this image. So it's a supervised learning problem. And now we want to design our architecture around it. Okay, so the first thing what they did is um, they, um, they used convolutions. In this case, they use a 5 by 5 convolution with, one, uh, with a stride of 1 and no padding in this case, right? So, um, so let's see. So we're going here from a 32 times 32 times 1 volume to a 28 times 28 times 6 volume. So, right, this is a valid convolution. It shrinks it. There's no padding. Um, question is how many convolutional filters are in the first layer? Well, we're checking here. We have here a depth of 6. So we have 6 5 by 5 convolutions with a stride of 1. Um, and this is very common. What you do at the beginning, you shrink the convolution a little bit. Sorry, the convolution shrinks the size of the resolution a little bit. Um, but typically what you want to do when you design these architectures, you want to increase the feature map size, meaning that we're adding more than a, well, a single convolution wouldn't make much sense. So in modern architectures, you will see this will become even more extreme. So we're going to have more and more filters coming. Um, but again, be aware, this is something that people have been doing in the 90s. Um, so they didn't have a lot of compute budget available. So the networks were comparatively small um, to what, you know, state of the art networks today could actually do. Okay, so um, we established, we have a convolution, we shrink the size a little bit, and in this case, we have six convolutional filters. Um, oh yeah, trick question, how many weights do we have here? Well, we have five by five weights in terms of filter weights per kernel. We have a bias, so it's five times five plus one, so we have 26 weights per filter, and we have six of them together, right? Um, okay. So then they used an average pooling. Um, so average pooling at the time was used pretty heavily. Um, in modern convolutional architectures, you would more use max pooling, which is more common. Um, technically, you can still use either one. Both of them have the property that there's no trainable parameters. Um, and the high level idea is that you basically go ahead and reduce the size a little bit, right? So here we have a pooling size of two. We have a stride of two. Um, which is very common. So you're basically halving the absolute um, resolution in X and Y here, right? So we're going from 28 times 28 times 6 to 14 times 14 times 6. Um, and again, this is something that at the time was used quite a bit. Um, I mean, so I mean, obviously the channel idea is here, we just want to reduce the resolution to make, you know, quote unquote, make it more tractable. Um, today, again, you wouldn't do it that extremely. You would probably keep the resolution a bit higher because you have more uh, computational resources to get better features out of it. Um, okay, so we have, again, convolution. We have a pooling layer. And now what we have is 
Uh, we have another convolution here. We have a five by five convolution with stride one. Um, again, these are valid convolutions. So we go here from 14 times 14 to 10 by 10, meaning that we have no padding. Um, question how many filters are being used here we're using 16 filters because that's the depth here of the output um, and then it follows another average pooling and in this average pooling again we have a filter size or we have a pooling size of 2 and a stride of 2 so we again have the spatial resolution and go from 10 by 10 to 5 by 5 um, and then we gotta get a 5 times 5 times 16 feature map out of these four layers right okay so we have filter so conf pool conf pool and now what we do is we have to map this to a classification result and now what's going to happen is um, there's going to be a fully connected layer at the end um, and in this case we're going from 15 times so 5 times 5 times 16 to 120 and then to 84 um, and then you get to get a classification scores and this one gets you to uh, in total of 10 scores because that's what uh, that's how many classes we have here, right? Okay, so this is basically standard MLP, just fully connected layer. Uh, and here we have pool con, sorry, conf pool conf pool. Um, the one thing I didn't talk about right now is we also need to do some activations. Uh, in this case, for this linnet at the time, there was a combination used of 10H and sigmoid activations. Um, so this one was very, very common at the time. And today, as I said already, when, when we talked about the activations, today you would actually not do it this way anymore. Today you would mostly use ReLU-based networks. We'll see this in a second. Um, and this is kind of part of the, the, the history a little bit. Um, people at the time thought they needed a smooth function um, to give you good gradients, um, but it turns out the ReLUs work better because they don't have these vanishing gradient issues. Okay, so um, yeah. And, one part of the issue here is basically you needed to have very good initializations uh, for your for your weights because otherwise if you don't have good initializations your gradients are going to be in a regime in the 10h or sigmoid functions where you just don't have good gradients at the time being okay um and then what you do is you running essentially um well you can shorten this whole thing right so what we have is here conf pool conf pool conf fc and the typical strategy what you get is um if you go further down the network, you're gonna, you're gonna. Um, so as we go deeper, um, you're gonna reduce the width and the height. So the spatial dimension is gonna reduce. You see here we start at 32 times 32, and we end up here at five times five. Um, and typically, what you do is you also, as you deeper you go, you you increasing the number of filters, and you're getting more and more features. Um, I said this before. This six here in a modern network, you would also have more. So typically, you're going to have more more filters and generally have larger, um, i.e., more powerful features because you have more compute capacity now with modern networks. Okay, um, and if you're summing all of this stuff up together, I mean, you can do the math, right? If you're taking all of this stuff together, maybe that's a good exercise for you at home. Uh, this network here has roughly sixty thousand parameters, so it's a very very small network comparatively speaking to what you would do today. Um, but at the time, you know, this was what, pretty much what people were able to, to use and to train on. Um, and this was used to train this digit recognition on these 10 classes. And this was pretty famous because this was kind of one of the first networks that was actually used in action. Um, and people since then have, you know, referred to it one of the classic uh, neural network architecture. Okay, so now um, we also have to talk a little bit about the training data. And this is something that is going to be pretty important because um, you can guess this network here with 60,000 parameters is relatively easy to train. So what people do here is most of the time they train stuff like this on MNIST. So MNIST is a data set that has um, tens of thousands um, uh, of, uh, of like handwritten grayscale images at a very low resolution. Um, this is something people use typically to train these networks. Um, but of course, this is something that doesn't scale on whole images. And as part of the idea of having neural networks that are larger, um, the research community also had to establish, um, they also has to, had to establish neural network um, training data that was good enough to train these larger networks. And it was not just the training data that was important, it was also important to, to kind of agree on a common, yeah, on a common sense to evaluate it. 
right? We had to measure how good the performance is. So we needed to have like training data on one hand, but we also needed to have some sort of like uh, evaluation data to figure out how good the networks are. Um, and one of the very common test benchmarks that people are using here is ImageNet. Um, so ImageNet um, has been done by the group of Fei Li, um, and they have used this ImageNet data set um, quite extensively. So they worked on providing annotations um, for this data. And this is a data set that in total has something like, I don't know, like 10, 10 million plus images. Um, they have uh, classification results and um, they, yeah, this has been established more or less, more or less as, a, as a classification benchmark um, for, for like the last, I don't know, like 13 years or something like this. Um, and they also typically host a, a challenge and a challenge in the academic community means um, they, they just say, oh, look, we're going to give you some data out there. Please run your neural network on it. Tell us your results um, and we will let you know how well you were doing in practice. And then there's a competition and then various teams submitting to these benchmarks and to these challenges and they can see how well their respective networks are doing. And ImageNet is, again, it's a very popular data set. A lot of people use it and also the challenge in the benchmark. Um, typically, this is run by Olga Rosankowski. Um, so these guys, um, they, they have spent a lot of effort in the sense of making sure they have a fair evaluation and they're hosting these competitions every year. Okay, but let's have a little bit of a look what's important here. So if you're talking about ImageNet, um, I mentioned already they have, you know, like something like 10 million-ish images, a little bit more, I think. I think it's actually 14 or so. Um, and then what they um, also have is they have roughly about a thousand classes. And this is kind of important. So a thousand classes means it's actually quite a difficult problem. However, the core idea around that is that the more classes you have, the stronger the features you can actually learn. So they argued, well, they needed a diverse enough data set. Otherwise, you can't learn very good features at the end out of it. Okay. And now when they're evaluating these metrics or when they're evaluating these net, uh, methods, then they have certain metrics to do. Um, and typically what you get is less either top one score or top five score. Um, and let me explain what that is. So top five, top one score means um, literally just check if the network prediction matches whatever the annotation was, right? So check if a sample's top class. Um, is the same as the target label. So the one with the highest probability, does it match? So basically, does the, the, the top one basically means does the classifier predict the right stuff? Now, people have thought, well, th this might be a bit harsh and maybe sometimes it's even a bit ambiguous what the respective underlying image should be. Um, so ImageNet, for instance, is notorious to have um, a lot of different dog breeds. Um, and the argument here is to say, well, relax the metric a little bit and say, well, instead of saying, oh, the very top answer has to be the right one, a top five score would say, check if your label is in your five first top predictions. So the five predictions with the five highest probabilities is any of my top five probabilities, the ground truth label. And if any of them has the ground truth label in it, then you're going to kind of accept it according to the score as the right class because you were quote unquote good enough. Right? And you can, you can imagine you can have different metrics here. You can have top one, top five, top 10, and so on. Um, but typically in practice, people either use top one or they use top five. And specifically top five has been um, a thing that people have used a lot. Right? And then what people re report is they often report the error functions here. So they either report a top one error or top five error. Um, and the top five error in this case is the percentage of test samples for which the correct class was not in the top five predicted classes, right? So um, if, you, if, if your top five probabilities that you're getting out of your score functions don't have the right class, that increases your error, right? And you just compute the percentage out of this one on your test set, um, and that's how you evaluate the performance at the end. Um, and then you're gonna get very famous graphs that look like these ones. Um, so um, this is a graph here that on the, on the, on the, on the y-axis, sorry, on the y-axis shows the um, ImageNet top five error, right? This is this, 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 this benchmark here, what I've just shown you, this ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge. That's what, what this one, ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge here means. Um, we have the top five error here on ImageNet. 
So that's the percentage that any of the scores in the top five has the ground truth label in it. Um, and then what we measure here is basically the error. This is the error of the percentage, how many of the classes were wrong. Um, and then here on the x-axis, we're going to have the years, basically. How many times, so which year is it doing? And um, I'm deliberately only going here to 2015 because this is when the neural networks, specifically convolutional neural networks, made a really big splash in the community. Um, so from today's perspective, that's already quite a bit ago. That's already almost, well, it's like 10 years ago. Um, and you can see um, that over time, researchers have managed to to get the error down further and further. And this goes even further down right now. Um, but the big thing what I wanted to convey here is that between 2011 and 2012, there was this fundamental switch here. And this fundamental switch was that here in, in, 20, in 2011, you're gonna have non-neural network stuff or non-convolutional neural network stuff. Um, and then you're gonna have like CNNs and the CNNs were kind of ruling the game here. Um, and they still do. There's a couple of alternative things to CNNs now, um, but in principle, you could still argue that, you know, modern architectures for the most part on image processing tasks, they use some form of CNNs. Um, if you're interested a little bit more about these ones here, um, there have been methods like deformable part models, I think. Um, so from the Berkeley folks, uh, like Ross Gershig and so on, I think um, these guys have, have been working on these kind of things for quite a while. And, um, and, yeah, so you can see roughly before CNNs were a thing, before neural networks were a thing, um, people had like, you know, between 20 and 30% top five error on ImageNet. Um, and top, like 20 to 30% 20 to, to, to error here is actually quite high. So um, by modern standards, if you wanted to do anything uh, reasonable with computer vision, like error rates so high are pretty difficult to use in any practical scenarios, right? So for instance, if you're thinking about self-driving cars or so, if you're like almost yeah, like 20, 25% wrong on average. Um, that is not something that you can tolerate in practice. But then, as I said, then it got better and people realized very quickly that CNNs are going to be the future. And people realized very quickly that you can actually tweak these architectures such that you can get better results. Okay. And one of the architectures from 2012 that we want to talk about first is this famous AlexNet architecture. So AlexNet architecture, um, is, is interesting from multiple perspective. So um, AlexNet is a, um, he was a PhD student at the time. Um, this was Alex Kruszewski. So he was the guy who basically invented this first CNN style architecture that like slashed the error almost in half, not quite in half, but like made a massive improvement here. Um, and the reason why this is interesting is um, by, by, again, by modern, modern standards, AlexNet would not be state of the art anymore. Um, but AlexNet was very difficult to achieve actually at the time. And the reason is there was no deep learning framework because people didn't even know that it was a thing to do it right. So AlexNet had to be imp implemented literally by hand on a GPU, like, you know, writing like CUDA kernels, um, implementing backpropagation for each of the convolutional layers and so on. And now, of course, people have figured out how to modularize these architecture designs. But it turns out um, that, um, yeah, but it turns out that this is something that was really, really difficult to do. If I ask today in my, in my classes, how many people still know how to, how to, um, code C, C++ or even CUDA, um, you're typically going to get not, not a super, um, yeah, positive answer here because people nowadays use, use Python. They use all the, all the, uh, nice amenities of what deep learning frameworks do like Python, um, like PyTorch, um, TensorFlow, and so on. Um, and, but I just wanted to highlight at the time, it was very difficult. And I think this is a very remarkable achievement because people didn't know that this would work. So it took a little bit of like a leap of faith to try it out. And then it took a massive amount of implementation to figure out how to implement these architectures. Okay, so keep that in mind and be going over it. And there's a couple of design choices in the AlexNet architecture that um, are actually, you know, tailoring towards how to process stuff faster. Um, and before going into the architecture, I still wanted to highlight one of the big reasons or one of the main reasons why all of these things actually worked out so well is because everything that is being done here runs now on a GPU. So this runs on graphics cards and graphics cards are kind of tailored specifically to, to neural networks. 
um, because all of this, what we're doing in these filter operations, they all mostly matrix vector multiplications or matrix matrix multiplications. And this can be modularized very, very quickly and can map to the GPU style architectures very, very efficiently. Okay, so let's have a look at AlexNet. So AlexNet um, takes this input, an RGB image. And the RGB image is scaled to 227 squared times three. So the three here is right. It's the RGB channels. Um, and the, the width and the height is a square image uh, of resolution of 227 squared. Um, what AlexNet is gonna do right now, um, they're gonna start with first the convolutional layer and then they have a max pool layer. And the convolution layer here has a 11 by 11 convolution um, and has a stride of four. So it goes from 227 to 55 in terms of spatial resolution. Um, and you can see they use a lot of filters already. So now we have 96 filters here in this layer. And you can already guess this is already quite a few parameters, right? So you have 11 times 11 plus one for the bias times 96 parameters just in this layer here alone. And then they're gonna go further down even in the spatial resolution. They're gonna do a max pooling on top of that. Um, so this is a three by three max pooling kernel with a stride of two, meaning that we're going to a 27 times 27 image here times 96. So the, the, the depth channels here don't change. Um, and this is the same idea. Um, now, as with Lenet before, we say basically as we go down in the network, we want to reduce the width and the height. So the spatial resolution should go down and the number of filters should go up. But compared to Lenet, uh, we're going to just have a lot more filter kernels. Like here we already have 96 and the next layer we have 256, right? So you, you just go up in terms of the feature size. Um, let's have a, a more detailed look. Again, we had here 11 times 11 kernels. Then we had a three by three max pool. Then we have a five by five, um, sorry, a five by five conf kernel. Um, here you see already it, um, it doesn't change the spatial resolution here. So this is with padding um, and it has a stride of one. Um, here we have a max pooling here of three by three and a stride of two and it goes from 27 to 13. Um, and you see here, the important part is this five by five kernel is actually 20, uh, 256 times applied, right? Um, and at the end of the day, you see we're going from this image, 227 squared times three to a 13 times 13 times 256, right? So it's from here, going to here. Um, and then AlexNet continues. Um, here it's a three by three convolution. So now the resolution is trying to keep roughly the same. Um, for the most part, we go three by three convolution. Um, it's 284 kernels already. Um, three by three convolution, two by two, 384, three by three convolution, 256, and then another max pool going to six by six and 256, right? So you can see there's like basically on this lower spatial resolution, there's now a bunch of relatively small convolutional kernels of three by three, and they're running, and there's a bunch of them. There's Again, there's one, two, three in a row. Um, and then there's this max pooling, right? Okay. Um, and then what we do is we have a, a fully connected layer again. Actually, we have uh, three fully connected layers here again. Um, this fully connected layer has nine, 9,216 dimensions, then go to uh, 5,096, another 5,096. Um, and then we're going to have a softmax of a thousand classes because it's trained on ImageNet, the whole thing. All right, um, if you're doing the math, um, this is maybe a bit of a homework. Um, again, do a bit of an estimate where and how these parameters are distributed. Um, I hope I don't have it on a future slide here. So this is actually something you should look out for yourself. Um, but you will see these fully connected layers at the end, they actually contain a big chunk of the parameters. Like they are not cheap at the end of the day. Uh, and this is a consideration we're gonna later look at in a bit more detail. Okay, but high level, I think it should be pretty clear, right? High level, we have we have a 227 squared image, RGB channels. We have a, a succession of um, filter, max pool, filter, max pool, filter, 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 max pool, fully connected layer. And that's always gonna be the same thing right now. Like for most of the stuff what we're doing here, 
and we're always going to have the succession of um, of things here. Okay, um, the one thing I haven't talked about is uh, activations. So AlexNet uses ReLU activations compared to the uh, instead of the 10 H and sigmoids what Lanet was using, um, and compared to Lanet, the whole thing is is a lot bigger. Remember, Lanet had about 60,000 parameters, whereas AlexNet now we are roughly about 60 million parameters. So this is something that is very important to keep in mind. So this is like about a thousand times larger, um, and it's it's already quite beefy. It's kind of a it's kind of a good good network already. It's it's a very good baseline um, for a lot of deep learning tasks actually. And then we have to discuss a little bit what what actually made that possible. Well, a few things was made possible is from an architectural standpoint. Um, convolutions were already around in Leonard. The one thing what made a big difference is using the relos. So relos basically allowed you to have larger networks and deeper networks because you, you don't get this vanishing gradient so quickly. So you, you're not so sensitive anymore how to initialize your, your neural network layers, right? Again, remember the challenge with 10 edge and sigmoids is you have to have a pretty good initialization and it's very delicate to train um, because as soon as you like go out of a, of a good regime here, um, you're gonna get very, very tiny gradients actually. Um, the next thing I already highlighted, this was actually now, I think it was actually the first one that was implemented um, with like CUDA kernels and was actually run on, on modern GPUs architectures. And this is really critical, right? Like in order to, to scale this up to training on images with tens of millions of images, um, you had to have a lot of beefy compute available. And this is the reason, in my opinion, why deep learning took so long to take off. Um, because it was very tricky to actually parallelize the stuff. But graphics cards came to the rescue, and now we actually can leverage them um, very nicely. And yeah, so this was implemented in CUDA. Um, and also to give you a reference, training a network like this, um, again, the optimizations and stuff like this, we all know, right? Like we've talked about SGD variations, we talked about how the backpropagation works. Um, you pretty much know everything to replicate this on your own. The one thing, however, we haven't talked about how to implement the whole stuff in CUDA. And I still want to make sure that, you know, this is kind of appreciated because at that time, I think this was kind of a, a very, very nice um, engineering achievement. Okay. Um, yeah, so in this thing, I think, I don't know, I don't have the exact training times, but I think this was trained roughly on... I think it was trained on two GPUs in parallel actually already. So they, they, they figured out how to train it on multiple GPUs, but it was very tailored. Um, and um, one of the reasons for all of these dimensions here was such that they fitted actually on these GPUs in memory, right? They, these GPUs were still significantly smaller in terms of absolute memory of what you could fit there. Um, and they designed the network architecture such that they could kind of max, max out the, the GPU memory. And yeah, and I think this whole thing trains, I don't know, like one to two weeks or so, I think. I don't remember it exactly. Um, but you can you can guess it's at least several days, um, probably a low number of, of weeks, how you train a network like that. Right. Okay, um, and this was in 2012 um, when people published that. And this, again, was a big breakthrough because people suddenly thought, well, oh, wow, convolutions are actually better than all the other stuff what people have been doing in parallel so far. And it was kind of interesting, this like for, for computer vision, this was a really big thing because um, previously computer vision was always a bit, you know, within computer science, computer vision was considered to be, yeah, it's kind of cool, but doesn't really work. And now suddenly all of this stuff started to work out actually. So let's see, what did people do afterwards? Well, there was AlexNet, and then one of the next milestone architectures was um, VGGNet. So VGGNet is uh, Simon, Jan, and Sissaman. Um, the reason why it's called VGG, um, it's, the, it's the group name in Oxford of Andrew Sissaman. So Andrew Sissaman is a very famous researcher um, who has done a lot of work um, in computer vision and specifically recently in deep learning. Um, and VGG is their group. Um, and that's why they named this, this network after them. And the idea of VGGNet is they're striving for simplicity um, so the core argument is, well, you know, AlexNet had these, I think, 11 by 11 convolutions. If we go back, right, these, these 11 by 11 convolutions. So VGGNet argued basically, well, we're going to rather use 
smaller convolutions, um, in this case three by three, the smallest possible. Uh, we're gonna use a stride of one. And we're gonna pretty much use the same convolutional layers um, throughout the whole network. Um, and because the convolutions are a little bit simpler, we're just gonna have more, more layers, right? So the argument, give me more layers, um, but make each layer a little bit simpler. Same thing for max pool, right? Max pool is super straightforward, two by two. Uh, max pool kernels with a stride of two, that's the simplest you can get. Uh, so the ingredients are still the same. We're still gonna have convolutions. We're still gonna have max pool operations. Um, and we're trying to go, we're going to err on the side now where we say, oh, let's use the simplest versions that are actually available or the smallest versions that are available and rather than have multiple layers uh, that we are stacking together. Okay, so let's have a look how the architecture looks like. Okay, VGGNet. VGGNet starts with an input of 224 times 224 times three. Uh, same thing, it's an input image. You just resize it to this input. Um, and then what we're gonna start is we have a conf layer. Um, so our conf layer, when you see conf64, uh, that means you have, um, you have 64 channels here. So you have 224 times 224 times 64, and you do this whole thing twice. So you just have conf, conf, um, and you're gonna get a feature map right now that does not change the resolution actually. In this case, they don't go, go down yet. Uh, they maintain resolution at 224 times 224, but you see already it's quite beefy. They have 64 uh, conf kernels here already, right? Uh, then they do a pooling, so they half the resolution. It's a two by two pooling with a, a kernel size so kernel of two and stride of two. Uh, so we go from 224 to 120, 112 times 112 times 64. Uh, then we're gonna run again two times, uh, uh, in this case, 128 um, channel convolution. Uh, so this goes from resolution here stays the same, stayed 112 times 112, uh, but now we already have 128 features. We're running another pooling afterwards. So we're halving the resolution after that um, to 56 times 56 times 122. Um, and one thing you can see here, uh, so they had this strategy in mind that the convolutions didn't change the resolution, um, but rather they used the pooling exclusively to change the resolution. So this was a deliberate design choice that they make. Um, there's not really such a huge difference, um, but they wanted to strive for simplicity. So they said convolutions stay the same in resolution and we're gonna change the resolution, we're just gonna do pooling, right? So this is like conf, conf, pool, conf, conf, pool. Um, and then it continues, right? Now you have uh, conf 256. So you see this is 256 filter channels here. And um, this is run three times. So you have conf, 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 then you're running another pool. Now you're going to 28 times 28 times 256. Then you're going, you're increasing the feature dimension a little bit even more. You're going 512 convolutions. Um, you're running it three times, so conf, conf, conf. You're having a 28 times 28 times 512 feature map. And you see already spatial resolution pretty low, feature dimensionality pretty high. And then you're running another pooling here. Um, and again, this is a max pooling, by the way. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that. These are all max pooling operators. Um, and then you go to 14 times 14 times 512, right? So again, it's very spatially, we're already very compact. Um, you run another convolution, 512 again, three times in a row, 512 times 512 times 512. Um, so you have um, 14 times 14 times 512 here. You're running another pooling, you go into seven times seven times 512 then. Um, and then this is our final feature map. Uh, we're using that one with a fully connected layer at the end, another fully connected layer at the end, and then you're gonna have our 1000 dimensional softmax at the end, because again, this is trained on ImageNet on these 1000 classes. And then the whole network is trained end to end here and all the filters are being trained on. Um, and again, do this maybe also as a homework, um, take a calculator and do the math here and check out where and how are the filter weights actually distributed, right? So again, as a hint here, we have here 200. So we have here convolutions. Um, these are three, again, they're all three by three convolutions. Um, so we have three by three plus one for the bias times 64 for just this layer. 
but you have it twice, so times two, and so on. And then you go down. And what's important, again, check out what the difference here is between the weights in the fully connected layers and the pooling layers. And you might be surprised what comes out of it. So these two fully connected layers, they might have more parameters than you might think. Okay, so this is VG Genie. Um, yeah, I mean, but similar idea. Um, we're going to have conf, pool, conf, pool, conf, fully connected. Okay, it's a bit simplified. Actually, you have conf, conf, pool, conf, 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 pool, conf, 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 and then fully connected. Um, but same concept. Um, we're going to have width goes down as we go deeper in the network and number of filters, number of features go up at the end of the day. So yeah, this is something that is, is very common to all classification architectures, even today. Okay, um, you see already, this was done in 2015, right? It's like a few years later than AlexNet was done. Um, but this was a very, I think this was a pretty big milestone paper. And the reason why this was a milestone paper is people realized that the architecture, you could kind of figure out what's the optimal architecture. And what I have just shown you is actually called, not VGG, it's actually called VGG16. It's a very specific type of them. Um, and VGG16 has in total 16 layers that have weights. So the, the pooling layers are not counted here. Uh, so we basically have 16 layers, um, filter and, and fully connected layers. Um, and the whole thing together in this case, um, 100, 138 million parameters, right? Um, and at the time, this was again, pretty much what you could fit on a GPU. Um, so it's pretty large and beefy network. Um, but it makes it, it's very simple. Um, and this network VGG is still being used quite a bit today. So often people use these VGG features for certain downstream tasks. We'll talk about this a little bit later, um, but the, the simplicity makes it very appealing and it's actually quite a beefy network already. Now, the thing what I mentioned is, people realize that the compositionality of these networks and the modularity, right? You can try out a lot of architectures. So when these guys published their paper, um, they had this VGG16. And VG, when, typically when people talk about VGG, they're going to talk about VGG16. But in this case, actually what they have done in their paper, they have actually analyzed a lot of architectures, that, hence VGG16. So you might have guessed there might be other ones. Uh, and in practice, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, so they basically analyze a bunch of different conf, confident configurations. Um, so what do they analyze? Well, like the the main thing of, or the main message or the main takeaway message that they had is um, check out how many weight layers you're going to have. So you're going to have 11 weight layers, 13, 16, or 19 weight layers. But that's one thing they tried out. So they changed all kinds of different versions here. Um, the input image is always going to be the same. They always, for all of these configurations, they all kept 224 squared RGB images, so 224 times 224 times 3. Um, and now they tried a bunch of different uh, types of convolutions out here, right? So if you look here, they have here um, three convolutions of 64. It's a standard thing. Then uh, they're running a max pool here. Um, then they're running this layer now comes basically. So sometimes they have like another one here. Uh, they have some, some of these architectures have two layers here. Um, so, for instance, we, the, the 16 version here has two conf layers um, and the smaller, for instance, here has only one layer, right? So you can see how this is done, but the whole architecture design concept is still very similar. Um, so they always have, again, they have input, conf pool, conf pool, and sometimes they have a bit more convolutions, right? Um, and what's interesting in this analysis, they kept the layers itself pretty much the same. So meaning, okay, so for instance here, right, this one has a conf a three by three conf with 64. Uh, and here they just use two of them. So the type of layer, they kept the same. So they argued, well, we want to keep it as simple and consistent as possible. And we want to mainly analyze how many layers can we actually use. And they have a couple of variations. So here, for instance, they have, uh, they have a conf one, conf one here, and so on. But you can roughly see they have these different architecture choices. They mainly vary the number of conf layers. Here. Then the classification head at the end, which does max pool, then these fully connected layers and the softmax, they are shared and they're always going to be the same, actually. Um, 
And what's interesting here is the number of parameters here, um, what you get is between these different configurations reaches from 133 million to 144 million. So it doesn't actually change that much. Um, the reason why I changed it not that much is because a lot of parameters are actually here at the bottom. So you should have, again, check this out, like do the math here. I, I really want you to, to sit down and like figure out how the weight distribution looks like. Okay, um, so what we have just talked about was basically this, this, this D configuration here. Um, and the reason why this D configuration here has survived is because that was the version that worked the best. Right? So specifically on ImageNet, they tested it out, they trained a bunch of stuff, um, and this was the version that has survived, and this is the version that people had been using or have been using for quite a while. Now, this is cool for various reasons. So the first reason it's cool, it's the state of the art architecture. When this paper came out, people were stunned. They thought, wow, this is awesome. Like now we're gonna get even better neural network architectures. We're gonna get our image net error. We're gonna get it further down and, and this is great. So everybody was happy with the performance. But there were more insights to it actually. So, okay, so the modularity, the simplicity we talked about. But the other insight was, um, it doesn't work if you just add more layers. And what turned out is this D configuration was actually better than this E configuration, right? So by adding more layers here and adding more weights and making the network more powerful in theory did not improve performance. And that was a problem and it's still a problem today. And I want to talk about why that is a problem. And I want to talk, out what, talk about what the solution is. So the solution is these architectures, they are not perfectly scalable. So if you're adding more and more layers at the end, you're going to have a diminishing return at some point, at some point it doesn't even help anymore. It actually goes down in performance. And if you're thinking logically, there's a couple of reasons. Well, there's mainly two reasons for it. Well, then there's, there's only one reason, but there's different causes that cause this one reason. And the main thing is the problem is you have to do backpropagation. If you're adding too many layers, um, your backpropagation doesn't yield good gradient results anymore. So the gradients, they're going to vanish. This is a very common thing. You have a vanishing gradient problem. We saw this already with like sigmoid 10h and stuff like this, but with relo this still happens if you stack more and more layers to each other, right? Basically the impact of the last layer has to be prop propagated throughout the rest. And this is a problem basically. This, this, this causes an issue um, if you're having large network architectures, if you can't just infinitely stack stuff together anymore. Um, and, one, and, and one thing here is um, the reason mainly behind that is actually also the numerics. You have to be aware, whenever we're dealing with this kind of stuff, we are running on the GPU right now and using floating point numbers. There's even, there's, there's even more arguments for what type of floating numbers you're going to use. You can use 32-bit floating numbers, or you can even go to 16-bit floating point numbers, exacerbating the problem. Right? So the argument is, well, if I use half my precision, I can have twice the network size. But then if you have twice the network size, you can't scale it anymore because your gradients are going to be not so great possibly, right? So there's a lot of numerical issues. I'm not going to go into all the details here, um, but it's actually kind of finicky how to get all of this stuff right. But the high level message at the moment, what this VGG paper had done is they established this, this, this problem statement of saying, well, we would love to scale our network. We would love to make it bigger, but we can't do it anymore because we don't get good gradients anymore. And this is the thing what skip connections are trying to solve. Uh, so this is the solution, right? So if you're summarizing quickly what I said, um, the problem of depth is very straightforward. The more layers you add, the harder the training gets. And harder in training in this case just means purely, well, gradients are very, very difficult to propagate through here. That's the main message here. Getting gradients through here is very, very tricky. Um, you might have vanishing gradients, you could also have exploding gradients if your learning rate is not properly done, right? So how we train these, these um, very deep networks. Okay, so let's have a look at a network, how it looks like. So we, let's say we have two layers. Um, this is my input to the first layer. Uh, I run a bunch of, let's say it's a convolution layer, whatever it is, it doesn't matter right now. Uh, you're going to get some output, you're feeding this to the next layer, and you're going to get some output here, right? So input to a layer, output of the layer, input of the next layer, output of the layer, right? And if you're thinking about what's happening here is, well, mathematically speaking, let's say it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fully connected layer right now. Let's just make it easy. Okay, so we have here weights times input plus bias, 
It's just a linear layer in this case. Okay. Um, this gives us some output. Uh, we're feeding it through a, a reload. So we have a non-linearity here. Um, and then we're taking this one here and feeding it to the next layer. Right? So we have here input. Input. Weights times input plus bias. Non-linearity. Input. Non-linearity. And so on. Right? And, and you stack this, right? So this is the thing what you're doing. This is the main path how this works. Like you have input, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, and so on. With convolutions, it's the same, right? It's, it's, it's just, there's no difference here. Convolutions accept that, okay, this linear part could be replaced by a convolutional layer, but the rest is exactly the same. Um, and this is the main path. The main path here means that if I want to compute gradients, I always need to go all the way through. And the idea right now is that we're using skip connections. The idea is we're just going to have artificial connections that connect these two things here together. And these things are called residual blocks. Um, residual blocks look like that. So the idea here is if I'm looking at this current layer here, I'm just going to add the input from the previous layers, a few layers before, in this case, one layer before, right? I'm skipping one layer in this case. That's why it's a skip connection. It skips one layer. Um, so this output here has X is just an addition of the features from here, plus all the stuff what this layer has been doing here in between, right? And that's what we see here. So we have here, this is the layer computation. So it's the weights of layer plus one times XL plus the bias plus the features what we had like these two layers before here, right? So we're skipping this one, we're skipping this one layer here and we're giving it still the information. And we're feeding that one in the activation here, right? So this was what we had previously. And now what we're doing is we also adding, we're just adding the previous information. Up. The way you typically visualize it like this, like it's very straightforward, right? So all you're doing is here, you're taking, um, you're just adding the features to the output here. You're skipping this, this layer here, or these two layers here in this case, right? Okay, so now we use, Again, this, this, this counts for convolutions, this counts for MLPs as well in principle in the same way. Um, however, it's very popular in convolutional neural networks. So like when, when I said like this is an MLP, in practice, this people use it for, for convolutions. Okay, so usually um, we use the same convolution since we want the same dimension, that's, that's important. Otherwise this addition doesn't work anymore. So this dimensionality of this dimensionality, so if you go in here, sorry, <laughs> this dimensionality here, um, and this dimensionality here has to be the same. Otherwise the whole thing doesn't really work. Right. All right. So using the same convolutions, um, we need to pad it accordingly. So we don't change the dimensions. Otherwise this whole thing doesn't work anymore. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise you need to do some weird padding and like, it's complicated. Anyway, so use, use the same dimensions. Otherwise this doesn't work. Okay. And this thing is called a residual block. Now we have a residual block here. Okay. Um, so how does it change? Well, we have this plane network. We have any stack two layers. Like, again, let's assume these are convolutions. Uh, this is the plane version, what we had before. This is what Alex and so on is doing. You have like input, layer, relu, layer, relu, and so on. And now this residual network is add the identity to it. And this is important. Like, um, I'm going to call this the identity because the whole point, if you think about it is the network right now, what this, what, the, what these two layers here are doing now, they're doing nothing else but manipulating the stream. So if these layers did not exist, it would just forward the input. It would just forward the input image, right? Uh, and the argument right now is these layers in between the residual block, in theory, could have more layers actually, but typically that's how people do it. Um, the, adding this one together in practice just means let's manipulate the stream of features. And the argument is easier to manipulate it based on the identity rather than having to learn to forward the whole identity. And this is the whole idea of these, uh, of these ResNet blocks. And now you see we are a year later, this is um, ResNet is 2016. Uh, and ResNets stand for residual networks or residual blocks. Um, ResNet is de facto a big game changer how you can scale up network training now. Uh, so in practice, these networks look more like that now, right? 
Um, so this is a ResNet. This is a 34 layer residual network. You can scale this thing up quite a bit right now, actually. You can have basically just deeper networks. Um, and the argument is deeper networks help. If you can get gradients, use a ResNet to get all these good gradients, right? So you have this very, very deep networks here. Um, and one of the ResNets here was, um, yeah, was like this configuration. So they use a uh, Harvey divided by two initialization. They use SGD momentum. Uh, they use a learning rate of 0.1. And then they have a learning rate scheduler that divide by 10 whenever they hit a plateau. Mini batch size of 256, a uh, weight decay of uh, 10 to the power of minus five and no dropout actually at the moment. This is interesting. Dropouts over the history, they sometimes come and go. Um, there's newer networks that use it again. It's kind of funny though. Okay, so if you're taking a network like this one, uh, this here, this visualization here, shows you a 34 layer network. And typically when you hear that, they just append their respective number of layers afterwards. Like VTG 16, you know, oh, it's 16 conf layers. Um, and ResNet 34 is 34 layers. Okay. Um, this can go up quite a bit. And this is a version that is relatively large. This is 152 layers ResNet. And they use, and this is about 60 million parameters. So what's interesting about that one is actually, this is also a relatively simple architecture in a sense. So if you're going back very quickly, I'm gonna quickly go here, just as a reminder, uh, this layer, we had here 130, or like, if you're looking here, these were the numbers of the VGG network variation. They're like 130, 140 million parameters, right? Um, this one is actually quite a bit less than half, actually. So this ResNet 152 is half, it's less than half of the parameters than the VGG versions had, the larger VGG versions, right? And you'll see this one works actually a lot better. So fewer parameters, but it's more efficient how to train them in a sense. Okay, um, so let's have a look at a few numbers. So again, ResNet is super important. Like if you wanna, if you wanna start a state-of-the-art classifier, I would always start with a, with a small ResNet, even today. Like you're starting with like, I don't know, ResNet 18 is a very popular architecture that's not too large. Uh, I think ResNet 18 has something like, I don't know, 12, 13 million parameters. That's roughly doable. That's already a beefy network. Like this is already a massive network in a sense. Okay, okay, ResNet. Let's have an analysis here. So this I think is a pretty, this is without ResNet. This is just the standard analysis without residual blocks. So if we make the network deeper, at some by performance degrade. And this is what this graph shows. So this is the error you're getting. This is the ImageNet, I think top five error, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the number of, it, uh, uh, the number of iterations like how long you train. So in theory, the longer you train, the error should go down. And these are the different network variations. So we have 20 layer network, a 32 layer network, a 44 layer network, and a 56 layer network, right? And what's interesting right now is um, the 20 layer network here. Oh, sorry. I think this is the training, this is the uh, training performance, and this on top is the validation performance. So if you're looking at the training performance, what's kind of funny is here. So the 20 and 32 networks, they roughly look the same. Um, so they don't make a big difference. If you went further down in the layers, remember like VGG 16 was actually performing the best here. But the error is basically here goes up. So the more layers you're adding, the worse it gets, which is kind of counterintuitive. You would expect that the training error would at least go down because you're adding more capacity. It should even memorize more stuff. It should overfit even a little bit more. But again, it's not happening, right? So the problem here is very simple. The more layer you add, so the, the 56 dimensional network doesn't go better. In fact, it gets worse and it gets worse quite significantly. Okay, so how does the same curve look like uh, with ResNets? Well, I mean, you guessed it. The more layers we're adding, the better the whole thing gets. Um, so let's here have a look at the validation. That's the top one. Uh, we have different ResNet configurations from ResNet 20, ResNet 32, ResNet 44, ResNet 56 to ResNet 110. Uh, we're starting here at 20 and we're going down to 110. So if you're going to ResNet 20, well, our error is roughly like this. And the more layers we're adding, the 110 version here goes already down here, right? So the more layers you add, better performance you get. Great. That's what we wanted. Now we can scale stuff up. Uh, and this is the opposite what we had with the plane networks. And this is why the ResNets are so, so powerful and a lot of people are using it. Okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about the intuition again. Um, I mean, some stuff I already, um, I already mentioned. So one of the ideas is basically, well, if we're having this ResNet block, right? So we have here features input in the neural network. We, uh, we're skipping this, this layer here. Um, the idea is basically um, that at the beginning, you can have a very easy identity. So let's just say for simplicity, if that stuff here was zero, right? Then this would just forward the input. Right? It wouldn't do anything. It's just an identity. Okay. If this comes out of an activation, then this one is also the identity, by the way, right? This would not, this activation in this case wouldn't change anything if there was a reload beforehand. So it was just like two reloads in a row wouldn't make a difference. And the idea is basically, then again, if this one is zero, then this one doesn't do anything. And the idea here is we keep the same values and added the nonlinearity. And if the nonlinearity is there, it doesn't do anything. So this is just an identity. So the identity is easy for residual blocks to learn. That's the high level intuition behind that. And worst case, this layer here in the middle, it doesn't do anything. Worst case, it's, it's completely bogus. It doesn't do anything. Um, if that happens, then it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make a difference. So it can only improve in a sense. Uh, and this is kind of what I meant by manipulating the stream of features. It's just going ahead and changing the features locally. And it has always access to the stream of features depending on where, like irrespective of where you are in the network, right? So you don't get these vanishing gradients that easily because the stream of skips goes throughout the entirety of the network. And that's important. And that's the idea when it resonates works. So you can scale it up, don't get vanishing gradients, can, can learn how to manipulate the stream of features, um, and we have a great architecture. Okay, these are resonance. Let's talk a bit more. There's more things we should talk about in architectural designs. Um, one thing we have not talked about is this idea of one by one convolutions. Um, and you might think, well, what on earth is he talking about right now? One by one convolutions, like a convolution of like, you know, a single kernel. Uh, that's just a scalar multiplication, right? Well, yeah, you're right. Um, and if you're doing this on an image, you see that um, a convolution, right? Like a three by three kernel, like runs a three by three kernel here about an area and gives you a value for this area. And you're then doing it for the next area here and get another value and so on. Now, one by one convolution just runs on one location. Right. Uh, on one location here, let's say we have a kernel, the kernel is just two, it's just multiplying five minus five times two, then it's going to be three times two, two times two minus five times two and so on. Right. So the output size is obviously going to be the same. Um, so the output size, like a one by one, there's no padding or whatever needed because the filter kernel is one. Um, uh, you're going to get minus five times two is minus 10, right? And you just do this for the whole thing um, and so on. So a one by one kernel is doing nothing else, but just scaling the input. You might, again, you might now say, well, why on earth are you doing this? You're just having a scalar. Why do you even call this a convolution, right? It's, it's technically, there's no real convolution. Um, but you remember, we're doing a little bit more. This is just the X, Y dimension. But what's also happening, and um, we are actually collapsing the depth with this way. So, right, remember that the convolutions, they always have X, Y, and then depth. So they go over the depth of the respective input. So if I have a one by one convolution over an input image of 32 times 32 times three, and this three is important now. So now what's happening is we have here these three for this one location, we have one, two, three uh, inputs. And this is now the same as having a three non fully connected layer locally for this one slice here, right? And what it's doing is literally doing a dot product across the channel dimensions here, right? Across the depth. So a one by one convolution is nothing else but a dot product along the depth, right? If I have a three dimensional uh, feature here, I'm going to do a dot product. Okay. Well, it has a nonlinearity too, right? Like it has a bias and nonlinearity, but otherwise it's just a dot product. And now what you can do is you can go ahead and have, for instance, in this input, we can have 32 times 32 times three. Um, and we have five, one by one times three. And again, this times three is important. Otherwise this would be just scaling the image. So this is our filter kernel. It's a one by one uh, times three 
kernel and we're applying it respectively everywhere and we have five of them. So it's collapsing the number of test channels. That's the whole point of this. The whole point of using these one by one convolutions is not to learn any features um, across the spatial dimensions. That's why it's a one by one convolution. Um, it's, however, it's the idea to shrink the number of channels, right? So if I'm going for 32 times 32 times 200, um, I'm getting to 32 times 32 times 32 here, assuming I have 32 one by one convolutions. And again, do the same thing here. Think about how many weights we have. So one by one convolution does not have a single weight. No, no, no. In this case, we're gonna have one times one times 200 weights per convolution plus the bias and then times how many convolutions we have. So this layer here, this one by one layer, collapses the depth from 200 to 32, so it reshuffles that basically. Um, and the number of filter weights here is 32 times one times one times 200 plus one, and that's the filter weight. Come on. Oh yeah. Um, the second thing it does actually, it adds this nonlinearity, so you can add more complicated functions. Um, but that's not the main reason why people use it. The main reason is literally to shrink the stuff down. And we'll talk about this in a second, uh, not right away, um, but for a couple of types of architectures, you need one-by-one -one convolutions. Um, one thing specifically where people tend to use one-by-one -one convolutions is they want it to basically, um, well, um, remember when I told you like these fully connected layers at the end of the classification networks of like VGG or something like this, or like AlexNet, you have this, this fully connected layer at the end that has a significant number of parameters in it. So one idea of modern architectures is to replace these fully connected layers, um, or at least parts of it with one by one convolutions. I'll talk about this in a second, but often these one by one convolutions are used at the end to replace the fully connected layers or like at least to mitigate the, the parameter issues, right? So the idea is you don't want to connect everything with everything, but you're just doing a depth-wise channel connect, collapse. All right, um, let's talk about another type of architecture. So another type of architecture is called inception layers. Inception layers is as ResNets, is a very popular architecture still being used today quite a bit. And the idea of inception layers is when you do a standard network, so the standard confnet, like you have to make a choice which convolution sizes you're using. Like VGG said, oh, let's use three by three everywhere. Um, but you could argue, well, why not five by five? Why not use seven by seven? And inception layer is kind of trying to alleviate that issue by saying, let's just use a bunch of them. Um, well, not all of them, but at least a few of them. So what you can do is um, you can go ahead and have between a, 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 a feature layer you can go ahead and have a block like that. So the idea is you take the inputs from the previous layer, you have a one by one convolution, a three by three convolution, a five by five convolution, and maybe a little bit of pooling, right? So if you're doing that, you're basically having a different, a different set of convolution or pooling operators for each layer. And then you concatenate the whole thing at the end of the day again. You wanna make sure, okay, they all produce the same resolution, and you concatenate all of them again to, to all the feature layers. So some of the features are produced by a one by one conf kernel, some of the features are produced by a three by three conf kernel, some of them have to be a five by five and so on. Okay. So in this case, of course, we have to make sure the dimensionalities match up, otherwise this whole thing doesn't work. So they all have to be the same convolution, the number of convolutions have to be the same, um, such that the dimensionality, sorry, the number of convolutions does not have to be the same. The size of the dimensionality in X and Y have to be the same because the features you can just stack together, right? Um, and yeah, the three by three max pooling here is a stride of one. Okay, so let's have an example. Um, I just want to show this how this works in practice. So let's say we have a previous layer um, of 28 times 28 and 192 dimension features, right? So now what you can do is you can go ahead and run one by one convolutions and these one by one convolutions, I'm running 64 one by one convolutions here. Um, they're running over the entirety of the image. They don't change the size. Again, nothing is allowed to change the size. Otherwise, we can't stack them again. Um, so these one by one convolutions, they produce a, a 28 times 28 times 64 feature channel. Uh, now I'm going to do the same. Um, okay, let, let's do the math quickly. Okay, so how, how, how many parameters do we have here? 
Uh, this one by one convolution kernel has 64 kernels. Each kernel has 192 goes over the depth. It's like the stock product over the depth. So it's 192 filter weights plus the bias. So it's 193 times 64 weights what we have in this in this conf kernel. Um, if you're looking here, it's a 3 by 3 conf kernel. So what this one is doing, it actually has 128 3 by 3 conf kernel. Right? So what this one has is it basically it's a, a 3 by 3 plus 1 Sorry, it's 3 by 3 times 192 <laughs> plus 1 times 128. That's the number, that's the number of weights we have here. That's already quite a few more weights, right? And here we have 5 by 5 times 192 plus 1 times 32. Right? You see, okay, this one is 64 dimensional, this one's 128 dimensional, this one's 32 dimensional, and the pooling here doesn't change it. Um, the pooling here um, just takes a max pooling in a region, but keeps the size basically, right? So it doesn't change the size in this case, you just duplicate the numbers respectively. And then what you're doing is, um, you're just adding all the stuff together. So now you have 64 plus 128 plus 32 plus 192, um, and this should be 416 in total. So this is the filter concatenation, right? Um, and this is kind of a cool idea. So the idea is basically you have like different operators within one layer, and you can learn different filter sizes at the same time. And I think that's kind of a nice, nice tweak. Now this of course a lot of hybrid parameters, like how do you distribute the different features and stuff like that. Um, the other thing you will see here, this is super compute intense. Um, this is actually quite compute intense. So doing it like this, what I've just said here, is not that straightforward. Um, so if you have an inception layer like this, and you have 92 conf, the reason is basically this number here is pretty high, right? You have a high feature number. So if you have um, a volume of 32 times 32 times 200, um, and you're running a five by five times 200 plus relo conf kernel and 92 of them, right? Um, you actually have quite a few multiplications. So it's five times five times 200. This produces one output. And how many outputs do we have? Well, we have uh, thir 32 times 32 times 92. Uh, so we have about 470 million multiplications here for this layer. And that's quite massive. So what do people do to alleviate that? Well, we want to reduce the number of layers, but we still want to have a bunch of different kernel sizes. So people try to do, um, they factor it out basically, right? So the idea is we're factoring this out in two layers. We're saying here we have a 16 conf kernel of one by one. So we first collapsing the dimensions with a one by one to 16. That's why we need the one by one convolutions here. So we have, we're reducing the dimensionality across the depth here. And then we're running 92 five by five convolutions, right? So if you're doing this one, this is, this, this part here has one by one times 200 times 32 times 32 times 16. And this one here has five by five times 16 times 32 times 32 times 92. And that's only about 15, uh, 40 million actually, right? So this one was about 400 million or 470 million. And this is about, 40 million. So this way, by this decomposition here, by this factoring, we're going to actually get to um, about a tenth of the parameters here. Right? You could argue whether this is good or not, right? You basically have uh, fewer parameters. Um, you um, want to have fewer weights per layer. But the argument what most people do is you rather want to have more layers than you want to have operations per layer. Okay. Okay, this is the fixed. Um, this is the, the naive version here that we had seen, the inception. And this is an inception module right now. Um, and this is the one where you have the one by one convolutions attached to it, right? So you just have these one by one convolutions to get the dimension a little bit down. Uh, and this is what they have used in this in this Google land. Um, this was this uh, 2015 paper. It um, came out similar at the time when the resonance came out. Um, and the idea basically was, well, now you have these inception modules, right? Um, there's a little bit of stuff you can still do here. Um, there's an argument, okay, this like pooling layer would dominate. So you're having like also one by one convolution here. So you're reducing the dimensions here. Like one argument here is basically, uh, if you're looking at this, these dimensions here, this is 192 dimensional output. So maybe that's a little bit too much compared to the other dimensions you have here, right? Uh, so the argument here is basically, okay, it reduces a little bit. 
Um, and then this way you can keep roughly the filter dimensions roughly the same. Okay, this is InceptionNet. Um, there's all kinds of different Inception modules. Um, there's all kinds of variations of these ones right now. So you can see, well, this is kind of can be quite complex, like what the right combination here is. Um, and this is a massive ar architecture. This is like a massive, this is this Google net and they have this compute graph of these networks. And this would be one inception module here or one block. Then you have here, we would have another block here, another block here and these blocks. Okay. So another thing what people often do is like, I'm basically it's now an engineering of like how to make this efficient, how to scale it up. Sometimes they have like extra pool layers to reduce the dimensionality a little bit, but I guess you get the high level idea. So obviously I'm not asking you to remember like the entire exact architecture of, of, of um, the Google net and the exception architectures. But I think what's important is to roughly understand how these architectures actually work, right? You have this insection blocks. They have these ideas of having multiple filters in it. You have to deal with the dimensionality because if you just do it naively, you're just exploding in terms of feature dimensionalities then you basically reduce it a little bit with one by one convolutions. Um, you do a bit of pooling maybe afterwards, um, but then you can build up these very, very large architectures. And there's a couple of, 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 of ideas behind that that actually people have followed up. Another famous architecture that goes in a sense very similar as BIRD is called ExceptionNet. Um, so ExceptionNet is the same idea what, uh, sorry, ExceptionNet is the same idea what InceptionNet had um, but they're saying they're providing depth-wise several convolutions instead of normal convolutions, right? So what they say now is like, okay, they, you have a depth and for each part of the depth, you're applying basically different convolutions. So in this case, you have 36 convolution layers, for instance, you structure into several modules with skip connections. And the argument is if you're doing it this way, you're outperforming the inception at V3 architectures. So inception V3 is one specific architecture here. By the way, there's a bunch of more inception architectures now. Um, but I want to I want to explain this concept. Um, so again, like the main idea is you have to understand these ideas. You have to understand. Um, okay, we can do incept, we can do resnets for skip connections. We can do inception modules to have multiple filters at the same time. Uh, we have to deal with dimensionality. And now now we have this concept of depth wise separable convolutions. So the idea is I have an input of twelve by twelve inputs, and now we have um, a depth of three. Right? So now what we can do is we can run a normal convolution here. And we're going to get an output that says we have eight by eight times 256. Um, and depth means now separable, we just for different depth separations. In this case, it's one it's a bit of a simple example. Um, we are applying separate conf kernels, right? Uh, so filters are applied only at a certain depth of the features, but we have multiple of them. And then the normal convolutions have group set to be one. And then the convolutions used in this image have group set to three, right? It's very straightforward. So we're going here from three to three, but we're running a separate conf for different blocks here. So it's like this depth separate convolutions. And the depth size is still always the same here. So the input and the output depth size has to be the same. Otherwise this wouldn't work. Okay. Um, and to fix that is you run basically a one by one convolution afterwards, so you can change it. And now if you're combining these two, then you have like one conf kernel in a sense, right? Okay. So what's the idea? Well, the idea behind that is, um, we have the original convolution. Um, it's a 256 dimensional kernel. It's a five by five times three. Um, that means we have in total of a size, um, 256 times 5 times 5 times 3 times 8 times 8 locations. So it's roughly 1.2 million multiplications for this layer. And the whole point is basically to reduce it. That's why it's called depth separable. The idea here is, okay, we have depth wise convolutions now. So now we have three kernels of 5 by 5 times 1. So the multiplications here is 5 times 5 times 3 times 8 times 8. So it's only 4,800 uh, multiplications here. And then we're running the one by one convolution afterwards. Okay, that one is still a bit because that's 256 kernels of size of 1 times 1 times 3. So you run this at 256 times 1 times 1 times 3. So it's 8 by 8 locations and we have in total, we have uh, about a little less than 50,000 convolutions here. Okay, um, so we have way, way less compute. 
But again, to clarify, this also changes the number of parameters. A number of parameters could be good, could be bad. All right, so another concept. So we have inception models we had, and now we have depth separable convolutions. So now let's have a bit, bit of a summary here. So a bit of a summary here, we have um, the ImageNet benchmark. Uh, on the ImageNet benchmark, we see that, okay, revolution of depth was around when ResNets and exception nets came around. Uh, more depth helps. That, that's kind of the high level idea. All right, sorry, I had to fix my AC here. Okay, um, so more depth helps. Um, the more layers we can use, the better. The way that made it work was basically um, you had these architectures with skip connections. Without skip connections, you can have better depth. Um, and again, if you see this graph right now, um, we saw this graph already. We only saw it until 2015. Uh, now we're seeing a little bit further, oh, sorry, 2014. Um, so you see, again, this was like before neural networks, uh, before confnets, we basically were at like, you know, 25, 28% image net error here. Um, this was AlexNet, which was already 16.4, with eight layers. Um, ZF, this is an important one too, actually. Um, Salen and um, Ferguson, I think um, that's the one. Uh, this was 11.7% um, error here. Um, VGG, was like 7.3 roughly. Um, Google Net was 6.66. The first inception net, exception net was already 5.5. The, the, the better ResNet versions were like 3.5. And you see that how this explodes in number of layers. So these ResNet models, they, they just had a revolution of depth. And this is continuing. These networks, they also have like massive number of depth. Um, each of them have simpler layers. And in total, then you're gonna get pretty good um, uh, performance results at the end, right? And um, there's a couple of caveats here. Um, I don't, I'm not going to talk about ensembles and stuff like this here right now. So to be good at these benchmarks, some of them use specific ensemble training and, and ensemble testing even. Um, but the point that I want to make is, okay, we're getting better and better, meaning the error goes down um, and the depth of the networks for the most part goes up, right? Okay. Cool, I think this is pretty awesome. Um, so we have pretty good performance right now. And now I wanted to talk about one thing I already hinted a little bit at. I wanted to talk about these fully convolutional networks. Um, and the idea is basically, let, let's just say we have a standard network here. This is what we have seen so far. Uh, we have seen, we have an input, we have convolutions, bit of pooling sometimes. And at the end of the day, we have a fully connected part, uh, which, um, yeah, which has a lot of parameters, right? But we need it in order to map our convolutional output back to our classification score functions, right? So we need that. And this is something we wanted to make better. Um, first of all, the big problem is these fully connected uh, heads, they have a crap ton of parameters and that's not good. So we don't wanna have that. Um, so how can we make this better? Well, how to make it better is for instance, we just replace these fully connected layers with something that has a smaller number of computer requirements. And the one thing you can do that is you basically use one by one convolutions. So convert the fully connected layers to convolution layers and you do the same dimensionality reduction and the same remapping with one by one convolutions. That's pretty straightforward. And instead of connecting everything with everything, if you're collapsing the depth first, you're just collapsing it within the current channel. And that's much easier. Um, but with these kind of things, you can actually do more. Because what happens now if I take a network like this one? This is fully convolutional. And the nice thing about fully convolutional, so, okay, so you map this to a, to a score function output. But now what you can also do is you can basically change the input sizes um, and this changes the output too. So you train on a specific size, but then at test time, you can change the sizes. This is the idea of fully convolutional. So fully convolutional now means if I have here a width and a height, everything is fully convolutional. Again, you can apply the conf kernels at every location. Um, you're gonna get an output that is a function of the input, right? 
Like remember here with the, with the fully connected layers, that's not possible because that always maps to a fixed dimensional output. So you cannot change the input dimension at test time. Whereas here with fully convolutional networks, you can actually do that, right? So you can actually come up with an architecture if you're having these convolutions here, uh, you can come up with an architecture that says, well, the input and the output of your image is going to be the same. So the input and the output has the same dimensionality. And if you're doing that, um, you can do other tasks such as classification. And a very common task what people do actually is image segmentation. So they do that, right? So the idea is very straightforward. You just take them, you do the math here, you make sure that the input is um, width times height, width times height. Um, it's fully convolutional. You can even change it at test time once you train it because the convolutions are invariant to the input sizes. Um, and then you can do tasks like this, like semantic segmentation. Um, and this is a network type here um, that is done by uh, Long and, and Shellhammer. This is this famous FCN paper. Uh, it's a fully connected network. Sorry, it's a fully convolutional network. It's a little bit confusing. Um, but it's a fully convolutional network and the idea is that there's just convolutions in it and nothing else. Right? The idea is here for one image as input, we're going to make these predictions and we're going to predict semantic labels for every input pixel here. Right. Okay. Right. Now, you can do that, but there's one thing what I haven't talked about. And one thing we haven't talked about here is you need basically to figure out how to have these like unit type architectures. You go first from a high dimension, then you go to a lower dimensional feature vector, and then you go back to the original resolution. So that's something we haven't done yet. So the first thing we've done right now is, okay, fully convolutional, great. But now we have to go back to the original size here. How do we get back to this? So we need to learn upsampling, basically. Um, the simplest thing of doing upsampling is actually not learning. The simplest thing is just interpolation, right? So let's say you have a four by four uh, input grid here. And what you can do is you just have some upsampling. Well, how do you do this? Well, you just make it larger uh, and you just interpolate here. Interpolating here would mean, well, interpolation, take the original image, upsampling it by 10. Uh, you take your favorite conf kernel. Um, you can do nearest neighbors. That's the easiest one that looks like that. Uh, you can do bilinear interpolation. That's a bilinear kernel. Just take the nearest neighbors and interpolate them according to where you are. Uh, you can do a bicubic upsampling and so on. So this is very common what people do. And the whole idea of this upsampling is I just need to fill in these values. So how do I fill them in? Well, I need this kernel what I just said. Nearest neighbor means, well, depending on where you are, you just take the respective pixel. Uh, bilinear means you take the n, these, these n pixels and just linearly interpolate between them. Cubic means you take a larger kernel. And you see this like interpolation here is nothing else but applying a convolution. And this is what standard upsampling methods and images do. If you're opening up your favorite image editing program like Chimp or Photoshop or whatsoever, and you're resizing an image, like any, any resizing image program, they're gonna have all these kind of interpolation kernels uh, to resize an image. You can also do downsampling, but we care about upsampling right now. So this is cool um, and it's fun, but since we are neural network learn, you could say, well, why do we need these fixed kernels? Why don't we just learn the upsampling? Well, now we do the same trick what we had here. Um, the same trick here means we're taking this four by four input, we up sampling, and instead of using a fixed conf kernel, we're just running this one, initializing this thing here with zero basically, and running a convolution. And this is called a transpose convolution. So you're just learning a kernel, so you're up sampling first, you leave these values blank, and then you run a convolution on top of it to fill in the values. And that's what it's doing. This is this um, uh, transpose convolution. So it's nothing else but an unpooling first up sample and then run a convolution. And that's all it is, right? So, and this is what's happening here. This is the input. We unpooled it to get this one. So we start with a three by three input here. And then we just run this three by three kernel here throughout the entirety of the image and we're getting a five by five output. So here we're going from three by three to five by five output. Um, these ones are also called up convolutions. Um, a bad term is deconvolutions, but don't call them deconvolutions because that typically means something different. Um, we might talk about this later. Um, just don't call them deconvolutions. Okay. They always call up convolutions. Um, but you get the idea. It's actually very straightforward. So instead of using a fixed upsampling kernel, you just have a learned upsampling kernel right now, right? It's very straightforward. 
Uh, and these transpose convolutions are used for these like segmentation style networks, what we've just seen. Okay, so now um, we can do refined outputs. Um, if one does a cascade of unpooling convolution operators, we basically get to an encoder decoder architecture. So I haven't mentioned this yet. So encoder means when you go from a higher resolution to a lower resolution, that's like what a classifier would do. A classifier is just an encoder with like a, a softmax at the end. And a decoder right now is go from a feature representation back to an original image. Uh, this is something we're going to talk a bit about more. One very specific type of architectures are going to be called autoencoders. Like we'll talk about this, like it's basically an encoder followed by a decoder. This is what autoencoders are. Um, and there's kind of different versions of that. There's like skip connections, aka units, um, you can add, and they are being used for segmentations for the most part. And a very common segmentation method looks like that. And this is a unit architecture. Um, unit means you start with an input image, you have an encoder, and then you have a decoder, right? So you first have standard convolutions to go reduce the spatial dimensionality, increase the feature map size, and then you're going to go the inverse and do these up convolutions and say, well, upsample again to the original input. And unit means there's like skip connections between these layers, right? So here in this case, each blue box is a multi-channel feature map. The number of channels are denoted in the respective box. This is the stuff you see here. Um, uh, the dimensions are on top of the box. Yeah, the white boxes are copied feature maps from the input here. So this part here is just copied to here. And then this is concatenated and then you run a convolution here, right? So you have the skip connections that help you to have access to the downsampled versions as well as the original resolution, right? So the argument is you have kind of the best of both worlds. You have access to the downsampled features as well as the features that you have processed here. Okay, um, so left side, um, the encoder part is that captures the context of the image. This follows the standard CNN architecture. As I said, the standard thing would be used for classifiers. Um, repeated applications of two unpadded 3 by 3 convolutions, each followed by a ReLU. Then you have a 2 by 2 max pooling operator with a stride of 2 for downsampling. And in each downsampling step, the number of channels is doubled, right? So same thing as before, width and height goes down and feature channel depth goes up. This is kind of the classification part. And the decoder does the opposite. The decoder says, well, it's an expansion path. We are upsampling to recover spatial locations for assigning class labels per pixel. That's what we need for segmentation now. Um, now we have two, pi two times two up convolutions that halves the number of input channels each. We have the skip connections where the outputs of the convolutions are contract uh, con uh, concatenated uh, with feature maps from the encoder. And then we follow an ordinary three by three convolution that doesn't change the size. And then we have fine layer with one by one convolutions to map the 64 channels to the respective classes. Uh, and here, width and height goes up and the feature channel depth goes down, right? Um, and this is like an architecture right now you see for segmentations. So if you have per pixel labels, you try you, you want to have a label per pixel. Then you see this unit style, autoencoder style architectures. Cool. All right. With that, I'm at the end today. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I think we have pretty cool stuff now because we have actually very fancy architectures. We can train classifiers. We've learned that. Um, and we have even things like um, uh, segmentation networks um, that we can use with these like fully convolutional architectures, what we have seen now at the very end. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Um, see you every time. See you everybody next time. Um, again, thanks a lot. See you and bye-bye.